Can you hear me? It's showtime. So we, we have grown so fast as a festival, and with your support, because you all are the ones that have made it, that tonight I want to share with you a little secret. We're moving the evenings to a new venue that can seat 1,400 at night. Plenty of room. We'll take all good care of you, okay? We have both rooms filled outside, so I'm sorry. And to our, and to, and to our other rooms, we really appreciate their support, okay? They're actually getting drunk right now, <laughs> all right? So, uh, so did we have a good time today? Did you enjoy? So this morning, it's really interesting. I'll tell you, Lee Child is speaking tomorrow night, and he, I don't think he's here yet. Can I? He's here? Lee? So Lee is speaking tonight. Lee doesn't do book festivals, but loves libraries. So when I, 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 I began the pitch, it was the library. Then I found out he likes fast cars. So guess what he was, where he was Gary Grace, raise your hand, Gary. Stand up. Gary, Gary took, Gary is one of my angels, and he started Supercuts. He t picks up Lee at the hotel. They go to Desert European Motors, where Lee got to drive the new Rolls Royce Wraith. <laughs> that was thanks to Helene Galen buying a Bentley that you got that, okay? All right? So t tonight is really, really special because... I get to introduce a man who, who I've, I knew right, really from the New York Times, and he's now Yahoo National Correspondent, which God knows he'll have to explain to us what that is. But he wrote a book on Gary Hart, that all the truth, and it really, to me, we remember the Gary Hart and the boat, what was the name of the boat? Monkey, Monkey Business. So we remember this, okay? So, so Matt writes this book. And I read it, and I said, oh, my gosh, I've got to get Matt by. And I tell you, again, he doesn't travel across the country for, uh, for naught. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight to introduce our first speaker is really one of the great political journalists, Matt By. Give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, all of you. Uh, it's great to be in, in Rancho Mirage and an honor to be able to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Lord uh, Michael Dobbs is a man of many careers, as you may know, uh, politics and government, journalism, advertising. Uh, but what brings him to this stage uh, in a moment is, of course, his work as a writer of fiction. Uh, he's written, I think, about 20 novels. I think when you write 20, you probably lose count anyway, but it's around 20. Uh, and is, of course, best known uh, here in the United States, particularly for his first book, uh, House of Cards, which, of course, uh, which, of course, uh, House of Cards and, and the trilogy uh, was turned into one of the most successful series in the history of the BBC and, of course, has become a spectacularly successful original series for Netflix here uh, over the last couple of years. And, and I watch it. I'm sure most of you have watched it. Um, it seems odd, perhaps, to be able to so seamlessly adapt uh, a book, a series that was written about British politics more than 25 years ago now, the first book, uh, to an American audience, an American story, and have it work so beautifully. Uh, I think it's not that remarkable, only because House of Cards is really not about any one moment or any one political system. It's about the, the very universal themes of greed and ambition, uh, conspiracy, and I think more than anything else, uh, mortality. The lengths to which people will go to build something that will at, outlast their own lives, to build some kind of legacy. In fact, I think if you, uh, if you were going to write House of Cards for an American audience today, the only thing you'd have to change, uh, Lord Dobbs, is you, you might want to take the, you would have to take the anti-hero, the conniving anti-hero who is a politician who has given his life to statecraft uh, and, and change it out for a reality TV star who's never been elected to anything. Um, now, I, th I think that would work quite well. Now, um, I, I presume I was asked to introduce uh, Lord Dobbs tonight because we have a bunch of things in common, three in particular, uh, that, uh, that I'll, I'll tell you about. First, we both uh, got our starts in Boston. Uh, Lord Dobbs was at uh, Tufts as a graduate student, went to the Boston Globe. Uh, I was at Tufts as an undergrad. I got my career started at the Boston Globe. In fact, 
The, the character, the woman journalist in House of Cards, Maddie Storen, is named for Matt Storen, who was the uh, editor at The Globe, who gave me my start, my first big uh, break in journalism, and, uh, which, is, which is terrific, except reading the book, I can't help uh, but think of my, uh, my old editor in drag, because it's a weird, it's a strange <laughs> confluence. But he, he did email me today and, and, and asked me to say hello. Uh, second, as some of you may know if you've watched the show uh, very, very carefully, uh, I uh, had a small recurring role in the second season of House of Cards here in the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, as myself, and in fact, many reviewers have noted that uh, the only thing missing from the book in the British version is a character named Matt Bai. Uh, actually, I've noted that on several review sites, but I, I think other people have probably picked up on it too. And, um, and finally, I would, I would just point out that uh, we are both uh, members of the House of Lords, which is a strange coincidence. Um, that's amazing. We haven't run into each other more often in London. Um, but uh, I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm I'm not really. It's, 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 a, lot, it's a lot of confusion. It's a lot of confusion. Come on, folks. Um, all all kidding aside, it is it's a profound uh, honor for me to be able to uh, introduce to you a man who has managed to make politics both riveting and literary on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I promise you that is a very difficult feat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lord Michael Duff. Nothing lasts forever. Even the longest, the most glittering rain must come to an end someday. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I mean, uh, you, I go around the, the world actually nowadays. I'm a fortunate man and I get all sorts of introductions. That was a, a great one. Thank you very much. But you don't always get introductions like that, um, particularly in foreign countries. I was in uh, Denmark not so long ago and I was being introduced by uh, a lady there. And she spoke really good English, but we discovered it wasn't quite perfect when she introduced me as being a man who had a lot of experience tucked away beneath his belt. Um, I'd, only, I'd only met her 20 minutes beforehand. Uh, you know. But it's, it's, a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. And to, uh, you know, I, we've been here, my wife and I have been here just, uh, uh, just over a day. We've met so many new friends. And this is a very special place that you have here, and a very special festival. And I want to thank you for including us as being part of it. Um, and, and thank you for what you do, because without you, the angels, uh, and of course the other uh, ticket-buying audience, this festival simply couldn't take place. And I'm just astonished, though, that this is only your third annual Writers' Festival. What you have achieved here has been something very special. And, of course, we all know that that is due, more than anything else, to one man, Jamie Cabler. <laughs> and all I can say, Jamie, is thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this great fun festival that you've created. You. So... Um, House of Cards. I'm supposed to tell you how House of Cards came about. Uh, I, I feel, by the way, I've, I've met many of you uh, over the last day or so, and you've all got proper jobs, um, <laughs> or had proper jobs. I, I, I've never had a proper job, as, as Matt just told you. I mean, I, I first of all, I started out earning a living by writing advertisements. 
Uh, then I earned a living by writing uh, political manifestos. But now I've changed completely, and I simply write works of fiction. Um, I uh, was fortunate enough to uh, stumble into the world of politics. Now, politics, you'll know the world of politics. you know the name politics. I mean, the word itself, as you will instantly recognize, is taken from the ancient Greek. Poly meaning many, and ticks meaning those tiny blood-sucking insects. <laughs> Um, and, and by a series of accidents, I fell into the clutches of a, an extraordinary woman called Margaret Thatcher. You may have heard of her. Uh, and, it, and it was an extraordinary time. When, uh, when she first met President Mitterrand, he went back to Paris and she said, I've just met Margaret Thatcher. You know, she's an extraordinary woman. She has the lips of Marilyn Monroe and the eyes of Caligula. <laughs> and by chance, I ended up being her chief of staff. Now, this was extraordinary. I was, I was young and naive, and I thought, they've asked me to be the chief of staff. This is the most wonderful opportunity of my life. And I, I burst into the pub uh, the local pub, to tell all my friends. I burst through the doors. The doors went flying. I said, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? They want me to be the chief of staff. Uh, and they looked at me and said, chief of staff? Chief of staff? What does it mean? I said, I don't know, but isn't it wonderful? <laughs> um, they said, but have they had a chief of staff before? And I said, no, this is a brand new job uh, that they've created just for me. So they said, look, before you throw all of your toys out the pram, sit down, have a drink, and we can figure on some other political chiefs of staff on whom you might model this new job. So we did. We sat, I sat down, we had a drink, and we came up with two. Two other political chiefs of staff. One was Bob Haldeman, who was chief of staff to <laughs> President Nixon. And they let him out on parole after three years of a seven-year sentence, I think. Um, the other one was Martin Bormann, who was chief of staff to Adolf Hitler. And I think somebody shot him, so I'm <laughs> very glad to be able to be with you this evening. Um, but uh, Margaret Thatcher was a most extraordinary woman. Uh, there are many tales told about her. Uh, she was rough, she was tough, and politics is a rough and a tough business. Don't go into politics if you want a calm, quiet life and a regular cuddle. You're going to get a regular kicking, and that's part of the deal. Uh, she, she was renowned for being very tough on those around her. And, uh, one day she took her, her cabinet into a private room in, into a hotel uh, so that they could, outside of uh, Westminster and official environment, they could, uh, they could discuss strategy and the long-term plan ahead. And so they all got into the, the hotel restaurant in the private room. They sat down around the table. And the maitre d' came over and said to Margaret, uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, it is wonderful to have you here. What would you like to eat? She said, I'll have the steak. Very rare. And she said, that is beautiful. Wonder. And what about the vegetables? And she looked around the table, and she said, they will have the steak too. Um, My little piece of the Margaret Thatcher history was that I was with her on election night in 1979, which is the first moment she became prime minister, the first election that she won. And I was there with her in her constituency. There were just five of us uh, in a, a little room. And I was watching the results come in. And I was the first person to be able to tell her on 1979, on that evening, congratulations, Margaret, you, you've just become prime minister. And she looked at me with those piercing blue eyes that she had, and she said, we will see, we will see. And goodness me, we did over the next years, which were extraordinary years, which changed my country's fortunes. But it was a rough and a tough time, and you could never expect to get away lightly with that. And the years rolled on, and the years of success, uh, and some failures, but many more successes than failures, and we came to... A, the last election campaign that she fought as Prime Minister, 1987, when I was her Chief of Staff, and 
we had, we had an appalling falling out. It was desperately unfair. It was very sad for me. Uh, and she was very brutal, unnecessarily brutal. But I don't complain. I'd had a ringside seat on history with her for uh, well over a decade, and we had got some extraordinary things done, and I'd been able to play a little role in everything that she'd done. Uh, but soon after that, very soon after that election campaign, I was away on holiday uh, in a little Greek island. And I was thinking that I, I should perhaps find another job. In fact, Margaret rather insisted on it. Um, <laughs> And it was a rough, tough time for me because, because I'd been working there so loyally for so long and, and it had all fallen apart. And I was feeling bruised and battered and, uh, and I was challenged. And somebody had asked me to write the book of what we call the swinging handbag. She always carried with her a handbag and it felt as if she had a house brick in it because when metaphorically she swung it, my goodness me, it hurt. And I'd, I'd, I'd received the battering. And uh, somebody had asked me to write the inside story of... Power and Margaret Thatcher. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that because I have shared so many secrets with her and I think it's, I think it's just entirely wrong to rush off now and sell all of those secrets and sell my friends for a, a pot of money. But I wondered whether I could write something that perhaps didn't cut across that, 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 that principle. And I sat down beside the swimming pool with a pad and a pencil and a bottle of wine to see whether I could write a book. I was just bored and I didn't know what to do. And clearly I was going through therapy because by the time I had finished the bottle of wine, <laughs> I only had two letters on my pad. <laughs> and I hope that you will forgive me because this is the truth story. And I hope you will forgive me for any offense that this caused because when I had finished that bottle of wine, having gone through this, this, this period of bruising, all I had in front of me on that pad were two initials. F U. <laughs> well, I didn't quite know what it all meant, but I was I was rather enjoying letting go of all the things that were inside me. So I went back the following day with another bottle of wine and F U became Francis Urquhart. That man up there. That's why he's called Francis Urquhart, and now Frank Underwood. And F.U. became his character as well. So I wrote a book. I began to get wrapped up in all this. I wrote a book in my spare time and over weekends, and uh, uh, as a book which was called House of Cards. And it was published. And John Major, who later became Prime Minister, said it did for his job what Dracula had done for babysitting. <laughs> And then the BBC got hold of it with that wonderful actor Ian Richardson and put it on screen. Now, it was extraordinary because it went on screen in November of 1990. And I shall always remember that because that first episode, you remember? That was the opening shot. Nothing lasts forever. And he places face down the photograph of Margaret Thatcher. That went out, after years of planning, that went out the very week that Margaret was forced out of Downing Street in tears. Oh. There's extraordinary photographs of the tears falling down her cheeks that you will remember. And of course, everybody thought that I was brilliant. <laughs> um, that how could I have foreseen this? Well, of course, it was a great cock-up. It wasn't a, a conspiracy. It was just an accident. But everybody thought that... Uh, uh, that it was wonderful, and I, 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 I found myself getting wrapped up in this, the great mystery that is called writing. Uh, I, you can, I suppose, be taught writing, but there has to be something inside you that forces you out of bed every morning to take up this ridiculous profession that is called writing. And I began to uh, think that I wanted to spend more time writing. Um, and I was convinced about it um, when the television program went out because the, the climax of 
Uh, House of Cards is essentially a, about the, the, my wicked Machiavellian, murderous prime minister, F.U. Francis Urquhart, and a beautiful, lustful, blonde searcher after truth, the journalist Matty Storin. And it finishes with a great climax on the rooftop of the House of Commons. Now, in my very first version of the House of Cards, as that climax came to its very end, it was Matty who won, and it was Francis who took a plunge off the roof uh, to the cobbles 100 feet below. But then the BBC got hold of it, and the BBC drama department... I mean, the reason I, I make this nice ending is because I'm a great believer in the triumph of truth and justice. Why else would I have been Margaret Thatcher's chief of staff? Um, <laughs> But, of course, the triumph of truth and justice is of no interest whatsoever to uh, the BBC drama department. And so when the climax came up on the screen, there was Matty and there was Francis. And it was Matty who took the tumble down to the cobbles 100 feet below. The beautiful Matty. But I understood entirely why they had done that, and they were absolutely right to do it. And they'd done it absolutely beautifully. I mean, it was a beautifully produced series. And anyway, I'd already cashed the check. Um, <laughs> and as the credits started rolling after the end of House of Cards, my telephone started ringing. People calling me up to congratulate me on my wonderful series. And with all modesty, I said, well, it really isn't my series, it's the BBC series, but thank you. But the phone kept on ringing and kept on ringing, and very quickly I had lost all trace of modesty and was <laughs> claiming full credit for everything. <laughs> Until it was ten minutes past midnight, the phone rang yet again. And it was my elderly aunt, Aunt Edna. She said, Michael! I said, yes, aunt. She said, I've been trying to call you all evening. I said, yes, aunt, I've been busy. She said, I couldn't go to bed without speaking to you first. And I said, yes, aunt. She said, I've just watched your program. And I said, yes, aunt. She said, you let the bastard get away with it. And she put the phone down on me. <laughs> so I decided to resurrect Francis Urquhart and to dedicate the book to uh, uh, my dear aunt, Aunt Edna, who was the inspiration behind it, and uh, Francis went on for, for several more adventures. Um, it, it is extraordinary. I mean, I, I did stumble into it by accident, uh, and I, I never had any idea that I would end up spending the next, well, almost 30 years, it was almost 30 years ago now, the next 30 years writing for a living, but it's been an extraordinary living to be had. But people keep asking me, well, you know, how, do, how is it that you manage to write political fiction? I say it's very simple. All you do is you take reality and then you water it down. Um, <laughs> just, just, just you have to, to make it credible. I mean... <laughs> have, have you seen what's going up in New Hampshire and Iowa? In the, in the reason, I mean, you know, it's astonishing. And I... I I remember that uh, I, I wrote some books about Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. And for instance, Franklin Roosevelt died with his mistress, just as uh, John Kennedy managed to live with several of his. Uh, and even President Eisenhower got into trouble with an, an English lady. And I, I also, uh, well, I also at Oxford, I uh, shared a, a girlfriend with uh, uh, a young Rhodes Scholar called Bill Clinton. Um, <laughs> And for some reason, the young lady at the, it took 20 years before she told me, and I can't understand why she took so long, why she never introduced us. Uh, uh, I suspect he was having a much more interesting time with her than I was. Um, anyway, the, the, the politics, politics is about people under pressure, people of ambition, of power, of often towering principle, but also great vulnerability. Because... In order to get anything done in politics, you have to get your hands on the sticky levers of power. And you have to compromise. And all political life is a judgment about how much you should compromise. Uh, and that is what political fiction so often is. 
and i found myself in this extraordinarily happy position of being able to lead a political life myself and use some of those instances that i came across in political fiction. and don't believe that i'm portraying anybody because i tell you if i had a pound or a dollar for every time that a politician had come up to me and said look that next book of yours um can i have a part in it um, I would have probably earned much more than I did actually by writing it. Uh, and then, oh, it must have been about seven years ago, I got a phone call. Hi, Mike. The American accent said, Mike? Nobody ever calls me Mike. Uh, but hi, Mike. Uh, uh, I'm from, uh, I'm from uh, Netflix. Um, and we'd, we'd love to do your book. And Netflix? Who are Netflix? Um, and I said, and, and Frank, I'd had approaches to do the book uh, set in America several times before. And may I admit that I was a little blase about it. I said, fine, you know, come back to me when you think you've got a uh, proposal. So I waited six months, heard nothing, but then the phone rang again. Hi, Mike. <laughs> we still want to do House of Cards. And um, we've got Kevin Spacey and David Fincher on board. What do you think? I thought this is a trick question. Uh, I have to think about this. Uh, David Fincher, Kevin Spacey, gods of Hollywood. Well, I thought about it for about three nanoseconds and said, yeah, you know, okay, this sounds like. And well, you will all know what's happened since then. Uh, Golden Globes, Emmy Awards, season four about to uh, come out in March. And, uh, and just tomorrow evening, my wife and I are going off to the Producers Guild Awards, where House of Cards is up for yet another award. It's been the most staggering adventure of my life, the most wonderful adventure of my life. Kevin Spacey, uh, I can tell you that when I got into bed with Hollywood, I thought this was probably going to end up as a bitter experience, because the, 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 the number of times that authors like me have been chewed up and spat out by Hollywood uh, are countless. But I have to tell you, it's turned out to be the happiest professional experience of my life. Because the people involved are superb. I mean, Kevin Spacey, the wonderful Robin Wright, that extraordinary showrunner, Bo Willimon. And, and, and Kevin is a desperately serious thespian who really wants to raise the levels of his art to, to the highest and spends a lot of time and a lot of his own money encouraging young people to follow in his footsteps. He has a motto, which he says he borrowed from Jack Lemmon. He said, of sending the elevator back down, uh, which I think is just wonderful. And it's, it's been a, a huge treat for me. And the only thing that I have to regret is the fact that uh, I didn't take my payment in Netflix stock. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I'm, I'm just got plenty of time. Great. Uh, but I do think at a time like this that I should, uh, I, I always remember something that Winston Churchill said. Uh, there's always something that Winston Churchill said. You can use him almost anywhere. And I, I have written, I've written four books, four novels, uh, and a play, and I'm still writing about Winston Churchill, the most extraordinary man, uh, because power fascinates me. And uh, having worked alongside Margaret Thatcher so closely, so close to the, the center of power, and having studied Winston Churchill, uh, in my view, the greatest Briton and possibly one of the greatest men that ever lived, uh, I've come to the conclusion that power is a strange thing. Those who, those who become great in the use of power, uh, very few of them are kind and comfortable people. They're mostly uncomfortable people to be with and uncomfortable with themselves. They are driven, they're obsessed, because you do not become a great politician by uh, going back home, putting your feet up in front of the fire, and reading a good book. You become great because you do more than anybody thinks is possible. You risk everything, and you just force yourself on and on and on. So when we go around looking for, for choir boys, people who never made any mistakes in their lives to become uh, our political candidates, I happen to believe we're probably making a mistake. Uh, give me somebody who's done something, perhaps made some mistakes, but, but learned from them too. But anyhow, the, the, the point I was going to make is Winston Churchill. Now, Winston Churchill was a, 
There's an extraordinary man there. I'll tell you a story about him and Lady Astor. Now, Lady Astor was an American, but she was our first female elected member of parliament in Britain. And she and Winston were of the same party, but they were really uh, of the same persuasion. In fact, they, they fought each other like cats and dogs their entire political career. She, for instance, was a, the woman who said to him, Winston, if you were my husband, I would poison your coffee. <laughs> he said, Madam, if you are my wife, I would drink it. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the occasion I'm thinking of is of when they went into the Guild Hall in the city of London side by side together. And she said, Winston, look around you. You could fill half of Guild Hall with all the brandy that you've drunk in your life. And the old man looked around him. He said, yes, she said. There's so much more still to do and so little time to do it. <laughs> um, and I want to get to questions with you. I want to have a conversation with you rather than me simply going on. But, but before I do that, and before I, I take heed of Winston's uh, warning uh, that I shouldn't go on too long, there's so much more still to do and so little time to do it, let me talk to you just a little bit about House of Cards and Netflix and that extraordinary revolution that is going on on our television screens right now. Uh, because it really is the golden age of television. Technology has changed the way that we look at screens, where we look at screens, the screens that we look at, and also the way that content is provided. And House of Cards, for instance, was the first self-made Netflix drama series. And it has helped revolutionize uh, the whole drama industry because it is not like the old type of drama series where you would have one series one episode a week and over several weeks and every episode would have to come to an end with some sort of climax, some artificial uh, climax that would hopefully engage everybody for uh, another week and remind them to come back in a week's time. It's, it's an artificial way of creating things. That's not the way that great stories happen. But nowadays, drama is written much more like a great novel. It enables, it is seamless. You start at the beginning, finish at the end, and in between, you as the reader or as the viewer can just look and read as much as you want and then put it to one side until you're ready to go back. And creatively, that has opened up all sorts of doors. So you have Netflix, you have Amazon, you have uh, all these other broadcasting platforms who are providing the sort of entertainment like Game of Thrones, Mad Men, as well as House of Cards, which means that we have a choice of drama series right now, uh, which is unprecedented. The quality has got greater and greater and greater, and it's the viewer who is winning time and time again. And it's opening up all sorts of, of opportunities, even for great Hollywood men and women, which is why so many of them, like Kevin Spacey, and David Fincher are coming. House of Cards was the first television series that they had ever become involved with. And more and more people are coming over from Hollywood to television because that is where the creative heartland is moving to right now. So it, we happen to be in a very, very fortunate period where uh, instead of things being dumbed down, as is often the accusation about new technology, we are actually seeing some wonderful television series which keeps, I mean, in fact, we've got too many. I don't know how you manage to watch them all. I can't, but I do my best. But it's wonderful to have that opportunity. So um, I would like to uh, simply say that uh, I, I, I've had a marvelous career. It's been a huge privilege to be able to spend 30 years as a writer. Uh, it's been wonderful to be able to uh, keep a family, to raise a family and to be able to take pride in what it is I do. But the only way that I know that I can take pride in what I do is by communicating with my readers, which means people like you, which means that audiences like this, locations like this, festivals like this, are a hugely important part of any writer's life. 
and uh, i want to thank you for the opportunity once again of being here with you this evening so i would now like to ask you for questions because i want to have a conversation with you before you all go to sleep <laughs> have you gone to sleep yet <laughs> then hopefully you'll have some questions so who would like a question sir Which do I prefer, the English version or the American version? What a rotten question that is. I tell you. Oh. <laughs> um, that's a, a, I, why should I have to choose? I mean, I've had Ian Richardson and now Kevin Spacey, two of the finest actors that I could think of. And I don't have to choose. I just have to sit back and, and encourage them and help them. I'm the great the privilege of being an executive producer of the uh, new American series. But at the end of the day, I, like everybody else, is able to sit back and see two glorious actors act their socks off in something that has my name attached to it. So I, I, I don't need to choose. No, no. Madam. What are some differences and similarities between British and American politics as you look toward New Hampshire and Iowa? Ha <laughs> ha. The, the differences and similarities between British and American politics. Um, well, you must always expect the unexpected, and I think that's very similar. And goodness knows what's going to happen uh, uh, in New Hampshire and, and Iowa. Um, and there is one thing in common. I mean, politics. Um, they say that. Politics is the world's second oldest profession, <laughs> uh, which, which takes all of its rules from the first. Um, I have to say that I think that's wrong. I actually think that politics is the world's oldest profession and has almost no rules at all. Uh, so, uh, but, but politics, we, we, we are very lucky in the West, and we, we're very good at kicking each other and kicking ourselves, you know, that the system is cracking, it's falling apart. Yeah, uh, Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst type of political system, except for all those other systems that they've invented. <laughs> um, and we look around the world at the, the, the chaos that there is, and I, I think we're actually uh, deeply privileged to be able to be born and, and, and live and raise our children, raise our families in, a, in democracies. The, the, the major differences between British and American politics, uh, and there are more similarities than there are differences. I mean, for instance, we had an election in Britain uh, just uh, less than a year ago in which David Cameron won an astonishing election campaign, which nobody expected him to win except uh, a few on the inside. All the opinion polls, every single opinion poll got it wrong. Um, but one of the reasons why he got it right and he won that election is because we borrowed a huge amount of talent from America, particularly in the use of social media, uh, which is now becoming more and more important in the way that we uh, use politics. Um, but the, the, the biggest difference, I think, is, that, uh, is the role of the personality. You have presidential elections. Uh, we still have parliamentary elections. It's how we elect our politicians, eh? except for the House of Lords, who aren't elected at all. Uh, I've got a job for life, do you realize? And, and nobody, uh, not even the queen, unless she changes the law, can actually take that away from me. Uh, so uh, uh, that's actually how the US Senate used to operate. <laughs> and then they changed the system and said, no, this, this can't work. And so they, they elected the Senate. And look what's happened since. I mean, <laughs> Democracy. A, they say the Greeks invented democracy and have been in chaos ever since. But um, I think uh, America and Britain and one or two other countries have followed close behind. But it's the personality. It's, it's, it's the personality that you focus on and actually the extraordinary amount of money you spend on it. Oh, I, I wonder how many hospitals could be built for all the amount of money that's spent on, on television ads. Um, We, we have very strict controls on the amount of money that we, we can spend. Uh, but, you know, I'm not 
trying to suggest that one system is better than the other, um, but they are both hugely important because the rest of the world looks at what it is we do. And, and if I may just be political here for a minute, um, we, the world's in a difficult place right now, but you go back a little while and we had something called the Berlin Wall. We had a Cold War. And that Cold War was resolved after decades of confrontation, of military confrontation. And the Berlin Wall came down, not because it was blasted down by missiles and bombs and bullets, but because it was pulled down by the bare hands of millions of Eastern Europeans who wanted what we had in the West. Not, yes, yes, our economies and our, our, our standard of living, partly, but they wanted much more than that. They wanted our freedoms. They wanted our liberties. They wanted to share our values. And we forget that times that that is perhaps the greatest strength that the West has as an example of uh, a beacon of hope, if you like, to so much of the rest of the world. And that's why it's so important that while we're doing all the things that we do, that we remind the rest of the world that the West is still not only the, the, the wealthiest, most innovative, uh, most expansionary, most exciting part of the world to be in, but it is also the most principled. <laughs> Sir. Sir, I've really enjoyed your insights as you have presented. I would like to know very hypothetically what you think F. Scott Fitzgerald would have thought of the House of Cards. <laughs> um, the, the kind gentleman said I'm brilliant, um, or worse to that effect. <laughs> uh, but what would F. Scott Fitzgerald have uh, thought about the House of Cards? Wow. Um, now, I, somebody mentioned something about F. Scott Fitzgerald the other day. Um, uh, show me a... Oh, sh show me a hero, and I will write you a tragedy. Wow. That's why I wrote it down, because I hadn't heard that quote before. Somebody used it yesterday, and I thought, what a, what a, a resounding note that struck. Um, I, I, uh, pe people, <clears throat> I don't know what he would have thought. I know people say, well, haven't I done something dreadful? Haven't I brought the whole of the political system into disrepute? Uh, and I keep having to say, hang on, guys, it's drama. It's not a documentary. Um, the, president, the Prime Minister of Italy the other week was photographed going into a bookshop in, the, uh, in Rome and buying a copy of the House of Cards. And I thought that it would be sensible uh, to write a little letter to him. And I wrote to Mr. Renzi and I said, Sir, here, here's, here's an inscribed copy for your, your library, but please remember that it's a work of entertainment, not a book of instruction. Um, <clears throat> And just a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, the president of China, President Xi, came to Britain. And I uh, had the privilege of having a, an audience with him. And I thought this would be a, a sensible opportunity to give him a signed copy of House of Cards, an original signed copy. As I say, they're almost 30 years old now. And I did that, and I handed it to him. And he looked at it, and he said, goodness, he said, do you have House of Cards in this country too? <laughs> Um, it would have been enough for me if F. Scott Fitzgerald had simply read it. And if he'd read it, I would have been very privileged. No. Another question. <laughs> um, uh, the question is essentially, um, who might Robin Wright have chosen, as I, if I understand it properly, chosen to model her character on? Well, Robin Wright is extraordinary. She, she's so different in real life from her character on screen. Um, but what the 
what's so brilliant about the, um, I mean, she, she, she's beautiful. She's actually rather shy and incredibly sweet, and so unlike Claire. But what is different, if you like? I mean, there are two things that always strike me as being different about the American version and the British version. Um, first of all, because we are now, well, the British version came out in 1990, so we're 25 years later, social media, the mobile phone, plays a much greater impact. It plays a, a huge role in a way that wasn't possible uh, in 1990. In 1990, if you wanted to leak something, you had to get a piece of paper and shove it under a hotel room door. Um, nowadays, you just tweet it or do something else with it. Um, but no, you, you cannot understand any politician. You cannot understand any politician who's on the, on the stage in front of the, the lights without understanding also what is going on when they go off the stage and the lights go out. Because they are like the rest of us. We tend to put, we tend to believe that politicians are a different breed from us, that they are two-dimensional, that they don't have, unless it spills over to the newspapers, that they spend all of their time thinking about nothing other than power and politics. But of course, it matters hugely what is going on in their private lives, whether they are whether they're feeling exhausted, whether they uh, their marriage is, is in good shape or is in bad shape, or problems with their children. I've, I've seen it all. I, I've seen Margaret Thatcher uh, in tears, literally in tears of anger and frustration and also perhaps anxiety, just moments before she knew she had to go into the House of Commons and face a barrage of criticism, which she didn't know how she was going to deal with. And she, I have to say, she, she dried her eyes. She went in there in the way that she did, and she kicked that out of the wall. She really did. It was magnificent. But you could not understand the extraordinary energy that she brought to focus on that debate without understanding the real anxieties that went on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote a book about Winston Churchill during... 1941, in the run-up to Pearl Harbor. And it was at a time when Britain was absolutely almost defenseless. It was almost on its knees. He knew that he could not win, that Britain could not win the war on its own. He desperately wanted America to come into the war, uh, but America at that time wasn't willing to do so. So he plotted... Uh, to encourage every important American that he could to come to Britain, to make them part of the, the family, and to turn them into great supporters of Britain at war. And a man came over called Avril Harriman, an extraordinary man uh, who was, became a very important part of the, the whole Anglo-US uh, relationship. And the very first weekend that he was in the country, in Britain, Churchill invited Avril Harriman to his home uh, to try to impress him, to try to make him a friend, and said, come and embrace everything British. And Avril did. Uh, within weeks of arriving, he was embracing uh, Pamela Churchill. Um, <laughs> in, a, in a manner that became absolutely notorious. Now, uh, but put yourself in Winston's. Uh, Put yourself in Winston's shoes. And he watched his son's marriage being ripped to shreds beneath his own roof. Now, as a father, how do you deal with this? I don't know. But as a statesman, of course, he was getting everything that was needed. He was making one of the most powerful Americans as attached to Britain as he could possibly be. Um, and at the end of the day, Churchill wasn't fighting just for his son's marriage. He wasn't just fighting for his family. He wasn't even just fighting for Britain. He was fighting, in his view, for the survival of civilization. And understanding what was going on behind the scenes throws an extraordinary light on what Winston Churchill was doing in in the spotlight at that time. And that happens time and time and time again. I prattle on uh, in answer to this question, what would Robin Wright have done? But the, the whole point about House of Cards and the brilliance that the 
American Sirius has brought is the creation of a partnership, which wasn't in the British version. Claire has become much more important than Francis Urquhart's wife ever became. And I think it's one of the wonders of what we're able to create now, as you never know quite who is, is pulling the strings in that relationship. Um, Oh. Um, I want to ask you about Margaret Thatcher. Um, during your nine or ten years with her, what was her best moment? And apart from asking you to leave her employed, <laughs> what, was her, what was her worst moment? What was the best moment? What was her worst moment? Um, uh, Governor Davis has just asked me uh, what was Margaret Thatcher's best moment and uh, worst moment. Um, she had many best moments. Uh, it's very difficult for many people to remember what a mess Britain was before she took over. Uh, we, were, we were in the grip of uh, militant left-wing trade unionisms. Uh, who, uh, the, the trade unions, they, they shut down the schools. They put picket lines around the hospitals, and, this, and pickets decided whether the ambulance and the patients in them should get to the hospitals or not. Um, and they even went on strike and they locked the cemeteries so we couldn't even bury the dead. It was an appalling time. And it's impossible to remember that now because she took them on and she won. Uh, she knew that she was risking everything, but she was the sort of woman who was willing to risk her career and her reputation and her government for something that she believed to be fundamentally right. Uh, she did the same thing with the Falklands War. Uh, a, a British uh, territory was invaded, and she said, we have to go and do our best, even when everybody said that she, it was impossible. And, but sometimes great people, with luck, can achieve the impossible. So she had many great highlights, and she was, in my view, the greatest peacetime prime minister that we ever had, despite all the things that she, she, she did to me. Um, <laughs> what was her worst moment? Well. Uh, let me put it this way. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that all British prime ministers do. Because unlike American presidents, you have a set term. You get there, you know you've got four years, or if you're lucky, you've got eight years. But we don't have uh, set term limits in Britain. And British prime ministers never know when to go. It is something about power that it becomes delusionary after a while. You lose contact with the, the, those roots that, that got you there in the first place. And so often it turns out that your first day is your happiest day because thereafter the world is going to conspire against you and chop and hack and, 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 and drag you out of Drowning Street, leaving your fingernails in the carpet. Do you know, the last British Prime Minister to retire and resign in their own time was a chap called Harold Wilson back in 1975. And he was sick. He knew he was sick. And, uh, but he made that choice himself to re retire. Before that, you've got to go back to 1937. It's an extraordinary record. And, and actually, I think it suggests to me that a lot of people now are thinking about set terms in, in Britain for various things. And there's a lot to be said for them in many ways. Because the sight, the Shakespearean tragedy that there is of people like Margaret Thatcher being dragged out of the front door of Downing Street in front of the cameras is a tragic one. But on the other hand, Margaret Thatcher was never going to go quietly. That was not her nature. And it had to be something which was almost the stuff of Shakespearean tragedy. She, she would almost have insisted that, uh, that her going not pass unnoticed. Um, the other thing I want to say about Margaret Thatcher, um, oh, um, I, may I tell one very short, uh, I mean, it goes back to the, the, the whole idea of uh, partners and, and private life. She had Dennis Thatcher. Dennis Thatcher was a wonderful man, a man of great principle, but much mocked. But they, didn't, they mocked him because they didn't know him. But he did have a huge sense of humor, and sense of humor gets you through many, many occasions. Uh, for instance, they were on uh, an RAF plane very early one morning, waiting to go off to India. It was uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. They had a long way to go. And M Margaret Thatcher and Dennis were being strapped in, strapping themselves in. And the steward came and said, Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Thatcher. How are you? Um, uh, can I get you anything to drink? 
And Margaret said, I'll have a cup of tea, please. And, and yes, and, and you, Mr. Thatcher, can I get you any, anything to drink? He said, I'll have a gin and tonic. Make it a large one. <laughs> and Margaret said, but Dennis, it, it's not even breakfast time. He says, it's lunchtime where we're going, and I always like to arrive prepared. <laughs> um, <laughs> <very nice. laughs> 